It's so great to be here. Um, I'm Sam Juneman. I'm the head of marketing and services at ADA. Um, we are really excited to talk about distribution um, with some of the OGs in the game. Uh, we've got uh, John Bear from downtown right here. Then we've got uh, Lloyd Hummel from Ingrooves and Mary Ashley Johnson from The Orchard. Cool. Thanks. So just to, just to get an idea of who's in the room, um, raise your hand if you are from another distribution company. Yeah? All right. Lots of folks. Cool. What about, what about a label group? Label? A labels. Okay, awesome. What about, uh, how about artists? Do we have any artists in the room? Yay. Okay, awesome. All right. Well, you're going to hold down the fort. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, it's, it's so lovely to be here. And I think, you know, all of us have um, a great, you know, history with, uh, with the evolution of distribution from a number of different angles. And I think there's quite a bit of space to cover with that, probably 25 years worth. Um, so uh, we're, uh, we're going to get started. Um, and I'm going to kick it to the group and kind of say, you know, we're here from every different angle of distribution. Um, there's many different flavors now that we've, you know, the evolution of distribution has gone 25 years now. Um, let's start by talking about how, how have you seen the relationship with labels and artists change with a distribution company over 25 years? It's very different than what we were experiencing, which was a relationship on the physical end, now to you know, a number of different types of flavors, almost, um, in every different capacity. I mean, I'll start. I'll just say that you know, I think at the core of what we do as a distributor, I don't think that that has changed. You know, it's really about empowering artists and clients you know, to really expand and grow kind of in whatever this new business is and the business is changing and you know it is you know becoming more and more global and easier to kind of move music across borders which i think you know that has changed but i think the core of the relationship hasn't necessarily changed and i think you know as long as we can kind of keep it about the music and about the artist i think that will keep driving the business forward in the most positive way whether we're sorry to you know kind of get into it, but you know, whether we're talking about the metaverse or we're talking about vinyl, whatever it might be, right. I, think, um, I think the core of kind of why we're all here and why we started doing this is important. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the role of distribution in, in education overall, because the, the change is so constant and the noise and the, the, the new things that are happening all the time, um, that's become a core part of what we do and a core part of what we have to do. Um, because as artists and as labels, you have the responsibility to develop your artists, to develop your marketing, to develop your vision, and you need distribution as a partner since we have a front row seat to everything that's happening all the time. Um, that, that has really become a core part of what our role is. Yeah, and as, um, you know, if, if you think about it, within our group, it's, you know, there's both the artist's experience, and at the end of the day, we're all distributing to our partners and, and creating the ability to have their music appear on these platforms. And it's about um, making sure that experience is complete so you're not missing a partner because you didn't kind of have that built in your tech stack. And so we all have to kind of keep developing and improving, not just improving, but just expanding what it means to be a distributor. And I think over time that was, you know, physical and then physical and digital. And now that means much more in terms of we're the conduit for metadata for the entire world. Um, and so when you want to be somewhere, how do you get there? And we provide both that education service so you know that, you know, maybe, you know, what it means to have your music available on Instagram is a license and that's a relationship that you have to, you know, opt in for having your music there on Facebook as well. And these types of things is, is education, um, but um, it's also making sure that uh, we're capturing what the artist needs um, and not creating a block in between and kind of empowering them or the labels or the label services and we each have a different component there. Yeah, John, you, it's funny because we, when we were talking before and in and, and meeting and greeting, technology was always like the answer to every question that we had. And I think um, I, I want to start with you, John, to kind of talk about how has technology really been the forefront of how you partner with artists? Because I think a lot of the conversations we've had is about 
tools and education and thinking outside of the box? And what are some of the things that you've seen in the last, you know, kind of three years that have been the point of, of contention maybe, or even point of education of challenge with those conversations? Yeah, I mean, if uh, each each platform is a little different and what the artist needs from, you know, choosing a partner, I think there's a, um, now in the last few years, it's become that um, artists or labels have um, content and they're looking to partner for certain goals. So does that partner um, have the technology to do the core or is it advertising services? Is it um, some content creation pieces or automation of, you know, we now all need different AV content for things. And some of that is about, um, you know, in our, in our business, it's about scale. So like creating lyric videos at scale. Lyric videos have a different impact on different platforms. And if you don't have those, you just don't have them. And you then are le leaving the artist to figure it out. You know, they get all these inundated by these different services and then they're figuring it out. And maybe if you can just simplify it and solve it for them, um, you don't need to have people chase disparate services or send their data all different places and then really not make the most of it at the end. Um, I think for us, it's been a, a core part of what Ingroves has been doing really since the beginning, but really in the last few years, we made a huge investment in data science and technology, uh, machine learning and AI. You might have seen some stuff in the press about that. Um, really, our thought is, is we're trying to help solve the, the marketing challenge and the noise that's out there. Um, dashboards a lot of times will tell you what happened yesterday and you really want to try to figure out what's going to happen tomorrow and that's obviously impossible to figure out especially in the music industry but the machine learning technology that we've put together is is trying to take a, a, a wider swing at what's happened in the past and be predictive about what's happening in the future and it's, it's a constant process it's iterative um, but if we're going to we're going to try to solve that. We have to get better at using the, the mountain of data that we have uh, to try and figure out what's going to happen to, to happen tomorrow. And I would, I mean, data has always been at the core of the orchard and harnessing that data and technology to, you know, be able to empower our artists and kind of give them information. I think the thing that we are all looking for is something faster and something more immediate and more accurate. And um, you know, I think that does put a ton of pressure on the data and product teams probably across all of our companies, which is exciting um, because we are looking to kind of turn that information into something actionable. And I think that's really like, you know, it's not just about getting data, it's about understanding and contextualizing that data and being able to react to it as quickly as possible so that you can kind of capitalize on the momentum before it's gone. Yeah, the action points are like a, a huge part because we can, we can, you know, deliver, you know, infinite amounts of data and there's like spreadsheets galore, but it's the, it's the, what do we do with this? Or like, what is this telling me? And where? And where, right? Um, so how, how are you kind of guiding, like, I'm sure a lot of the data is telling you a story that is going to come with a lot of like preparation for artists or eye-opening moments where they're reconsidering what their audiences are looking like, where else they should be um, in a digital space. Like, how are you, how are you guiding um, these artists into this place? Because I'm sure you have some artists who are like, I want to do an NFT now. And some artists who are like, I'm physical and don't talk to me about TikTok. So I'm sure that like, you know, there's a lot of education as part of this. It's like, how are you partnering and guiding with artists to really get there? I think one thing that's critical is like people get sucked into, they have followings in places and then that's the only place they can reach the people. And I think one thing we've been really priding ourselves on is uh, thinking about the artist as the hub and you control your data. So if you have a label services partner and they give you a, a streaming link that is just sending you to DSPs, maybe you'd prefer to have it have your, your Shopify or, or maybe some more actionable things. It's not all about just a streaming listen. Because then that, just like the social media platforms, you're kind of hopefully reaching that person again somehow. And if in the concepts of first party data, which our platform uh, Foundy, which we acquired last year and we've been working with for several years, is really focused on. So it's about having all these touch points and then can you do something with it? So if you know somebody is clicking a tour link, um, I'm always blown away that nobody sells merch before a show. Like I know that person's going. I would love for them to buy the shirt and walk in the venue with it and not hope they buy it there. I just went to Paul McCartney last week. 
I didn't get any emails about buying merch, but I saw the merch stands packed and they were like $150 for a sweatshirt. Probably a good little remarketing audience to like try to sell that sweatshirt to the person who just totally didn't go or looked too crowded or I don't want to carry it. So I think there's a lot of missed opportunities with data and it's the education piece is always like top of mind, like telling somebody that they have data that they don't just have to pay Facebook or other platforms for is, is educating somebody on like they can control something they actually probably didn't think they could before. I think it's also our, I think it's also our job as a distributor to help make it easy for artists and clients to be able to react to data. So whether it's you know through portals or push notifications or whatever it might be across our different companies, you know I think that being able to kind of react in real time and have it easy so that you know an artist or a manager or a label can be served something on their phone, a playlist ad, which we can all see the eye rolls. I'm sure we get enough of those phone calls and requests, but you know and then be able to promote it either socially or put advertising behind it and do something like very quickly in just a few steps and be able to kind of get that message out. I think for us, um, advertising's been a focus um, because it's you know, obviously one of the easiest ways to reach people um, online. And uh, some of the technology that we've developed is uh, a program called Smart Audience, which if you think about digital advertising, the whole point of it is to get people to click on ads. And uh, we want people to stream music as opposed to just clicking on the ads. And so we've, we've geared some technology to guide people to, um, to actually listening to music and being able to do all privacy compliant and everything, of course, because that, that's critical these days. Um, but trying to develop more technology like that where we can, we can get to that you know, end point to, to move audiences has been the focus for us. Yeah, and I think there's, it's, you're kind of grasping onto the theme here that we're trying to convey is like there, there is a different type of distribution partner for everyone mm -hmm. um, because the, the, the market is, is, there's so many options now I think we're seeing new types of options from every different level of artists now. And it's like, you know, you guys have individual great points on the technology you're developing for your artists and your partners, the, um, the action oriented things on the marketing side, like how are you, how are you seeing your labels and your artists or, or labels that you are aware of, like be challenged with how to pick, like who, how, how do you navigate which distro partner and at which level is, is the right thing for you? What are those things that you're guiding when you're talking to labels and artists and pitch meetings? Like it's, it's, a, it's a different sell from every angle and every artist is unique. So I, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see how, how you are fitting in your personality and guiding those people to make the right decision. I, I think it's about like the client goals and the client types. So they kind of self-select in a little bit to a certain category, I think of, and then you're kind of looking at what's the best fit there. So if you know you need radio, that self-selects something different, but if you don't need radio from your distributor and you have a relationship to hire that out, then you kind of it rethink, reprocesses where that right partner is. And then there's the concepts of, um, you know, advances versus not, and I think people with value in the market smartly or turning down advances or just making it be exactly what they want and not um, I think a few years ago it was just the, the, the options were different uh, for what you could do and um, uh, and I think on the artist level as you rise and go from an artist on a you know DIY platform to the next step it's about like what am I truly looking to get what is, has my team grown beyond me uh, if it's a big, robust team, that team generally doesn't want to waste the time of a distributor. They have a certain goal with that distributor, and they're like, I need this done. They're not looking to get on the phone constantly with you unless they are. Um, so I think there's an aspect of, um, of that like you know, nuanced relationship. Basically. Yeah, I'd echo just about everything you said. It really is about you know, where are you in your career, being honest and realistic about what your goals are. Are you, are you trying to have you know, a huge pop radio career? Are you trying to grow internationally? What, what, is, your, what is your music about? Where, where are you trying to go? And, um, and how good is your team? How skilled are they? We talk a lot when we're talking to labels about, uh, do you have a good team around you? And of course, yes, of course we have a good team. We have, we have a guy or we have a woman who, do, who does the things, but, but we really get into like, how skilled are they at understanding the marketplace now? And um, you know, some distributors are set up more uh, are better working with with really well developed teams, and some it's all DIY, and so it really just depends on on what your 
end goal is. So I would say ditto. And <laughs> I would also just say, um, you know, truth, transparency, honesty about kind of like what you're looking for and what those expectations are. And also just trying to be very uh, genuine about the relationships that you kind of have there and kind of how you're looking to foster that. Because at the end of the day, this is a relationship business and it, it does come down to that. But I think just kind of starting out with like, what exactly are you looking for? And just kind of being honest with yourself and checking in. And that's one unique thing is that at the end of the day, if it's an artist or a label or label services, at the DSP side, it's just an artist release on a certain date. And so it, it, it sometimes is a little different where it comes from, but um, it, a big CD baby artist gets tons of play, playlist covers and things like that, because at the end of the day, that DSP is, wants to playlist that artist. And so um, you're each, each where you're coming from, um, the end output in that relationship side is like, if across, if your relationships are direct, so you're signing to a place that has a way to pitch music, mm -hmm. that's far superior than signing to a place that is signed to a place that then has, you hope you got on that pitch. And there's a lot removed that you never know. And you can bring yourself closer to success, maybe if you think about like, how it actually works. But you've also got to be in a place to take advantage of that, right? You have to have the, the infrastructure to be able to talk to those distributors and companies who have those relationships because, you know, how many thousands of tracks are released over, you know, we, we've all heard those statistics and, and it's tough to break through that. And so you've got to have your ducks in a row. Yeah, we, um, we, we talked a little bit about like, how, how, as a label or an artist, like how are you identifying where your center is? And I think this is a direct quote from you. It's like, we are not, distribution shouldn't always be the lifeline. That we've, we've moved into this era where um, an artist or a label group um, should really understand where their center is and that distribution and so many other tools are part of the toolbox, you know, they're, it's, it's the whole gambit of, of what you have to use. And I'm curious, like, where you've seen um, people who are really keen and understand where their center is fly and soar and where that struggle has kind of been really apparent. And I'm sure you see it in every different facet. Like, how do you, you know, how do you guide those people as their partners? Um, well, the ones that struggle are too focused on playlisting straight up, but I think everybody in the room who's related to that knows that, you know, playlisting is not a marketing plan. It's, it's part of the project. We, you know, we should have gotten tattoos for everyone's forehead. Well, you, like, that's like a thing. You know, there, there are mugs and t-shirts available. My friend sells them. I'm not kidding. See me afterwards. We'll plug it after. I have one at home. Um, uh, but but the, that's where there's failure, where it's the, the um, great, I signed with a distributor, now I'm going to get loads of playlisting. Mm -hmm. And um, you guys all know, if you don't have that that uh, base together that, you know, that's not going to be successful. And we talk a lot about, you know, playlisting is not a math problem. You can do everything right. You guys know all, like we can recite it all, right? Have the music early, have all the details early, have a marketing plan, do your socials, do all the things. You can do all of that. You can have a great song and it will still get nothing. And then there's the guy that comes in three days before with nothing and it gets everything. Like it's not a math problem. So it's about you got to do it the best you can, and we coach them. We coach everybody along to do the best that they can, and you have that as part of your marketing plan. Playlisting. I think that's important because you know we we always talk about playlisting as in the marketing plan. I'm looking at some of the team members from the orchard who are probably laughing now, um, and you know I think that one of the things that we talk about is like you never want to put your revenue. Um, and make it dependent on someone else that you have no control over. So that revenue dependency of playlisting can be a pretty scary thing if all of a sudden, you know, 60, 70% of your revenue is coming from streams off of playlists that are declining week over week and you don't know how much longer that's going to last. Mm -hmm. So it's really about building the artist and building out a long-term plan and, or a plan that fits for whatever kind of timeline you're working on, but just make sure that you're focused on the music and focused on developing that artist. Yeah, right now, like the the lead up to release and that next couple of weeks is kind of the whole event unless you have something beyond it. Because <laughs> it truly is the playlist and then the decline unless there's something that's keeping the campaign alive. 
um, or else you're just you know beholden to the success of fans and their interest, you know, like and but you, you have to nurture it. Um, and we were that Mike that earlier reference was about um, kind of we all I think have landing page automation from our platforms in varying degrees and um, you know thinking about like that thing that was automated for you is the utility of what I want to happen when my fans see that the best it could possibly be because again like that moment of release is so important and if it was just leading somebody to the services without thinking about that as that's maybe my most important new fan and that new fan is going to generate like you know x amount for me over time or going to see my tours and going to spread the word and if you like miss the opportunity there you you miss it so you want to make sure that each time you're putting something in front of your fans what's the goal beyond like just the stream um are you capturing something are you nurturing a fan relationship um social media is great but um in those social media moments are you actually creating more opportunities to connect connect and, and bring that data ecosystem back in yeah and i think um we mary ashley i'm gonna put you on the spot because we were talking earlier about uh, our role in in the new, you know, where we are now with distribution has been how are we partnering with with our clients to help them monetize like the wild, wild west of everything that gets thrown to them every single day. You know, in the last couple of years, we've all been ushered into the Web3 world, whether whether we like it or not, it's happening. And so, like, at, you know, as as the future guide in the distribution world how how are we preparing our clients and our artists for this because and it, it really comes down to monetization right i, I mean I, I think that you know it um i'm all supportive of a, an immersive web universe and you know the the marketing is at the center of what fans want. Fans want more access, they want more information, they wanna know everything about an artist, whether it's through social media, whether it's through NFTs, or whether it's through you know, Web3 and what that, those marketing opportunities are, but it's also how you can help your artists monetize. I think that's the biggest challenge that I will speak for myself that I face is you know, how do we make sure that we're monetizing on behalf of our artists in the most efficient way and most authentic way to who they are and what their voice is. And not just going out and chasing a dollar, but also not just kind of letting all of this content live out there um, unmonetized. I think there's an aspect of like making yourselves monetizable uh, this may be more of a CD baby kind of concept of opting in to certain things, but the same as like when you sign your deal, you're kind of opting into certain abilities for your partner to exploit in a good way and make money from your music. So if you are, you know, um, against somebody touching sync, if it's non-exclusive, like why are you so against it if they can create money for you an opportunity and that one sync might lead to three of your own if you can like, you know, make friends with that supervisor after you get a sync. Um, so seeing your partners as creating new, monet new monetization lines or new abilities for yourself to monetize in a different way is super important. I'd say ditto, <laughs> um, but also with cautious optimism is how we're, how we're approaching it because we've all seen this before and I think right now we're living in an industry, well, I'd say we've seen some of this before, but, but right now the number of shiny objects that are happening in the industry is, 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 um, is stifling between new DSPs, new social platforms, emerging platforms, new territories that are, that are coming online. There's so much and we don't have a, we don't have a roadmap for it just yet. So we're being, cautious about educating with monetization at the beginning. We don't want there to just be a, an engagement opportunity that is going to help the platform grow because we've seen that one before. So we want to make sure that it's about monetization and protecting the interests of our artists and labels so that we can uh, all keep doing this. Yeah, I think so much of the tech that we're facing right now is, I think our artists and our labels really deserve to have us as partners to kind of almost have their best interest at play in in the ecosystem that we live in. And so, you know, as in the middle and distribution, we have to keep our, our artists happy, our managers happy, but then our DSPs happy, our supply chain happy. 
Um, so I, I think it's, it's right. It's constantly like, you know, balancing what is going to be the best move for you to advocate for your artists and their future. I think that concept of monetization is like, it's real estate. We, we really want this shiny building on fifth Avenue to be constantly bringing in business. And that's a future that they can live off of. Um, I, I'm challenging you guys to ask each other questions now because I really want to know, you know, it's, it's cool that we have, you know, four big distribution partners here represented, especially from a global perspective. And so I, I kind of want to hear what you want to know about each other. I'll start. <laughs> um, <you>. Sure. <laughs> um, had a lot of conversations recently about the avalanche of content that's coming every day, every week, every month. Um, and what that means to the, the balance of the ecosystem. Curious what you guys think and if there's, if there's a way through it. I think a unique thing is maybe that some of the newer platforms, I think this may be more UGC and, and um, AV. I mean, generally speaking, the newer platforms are more AV-like and they, generally speaking, are more UGC-like. And um, uh, indies, I think we all know, a little bit over-indexed there versus other places is natural. And it's like we uniquely see, an, a, a, uh, it was, a, yeah, like a, there was a, a TikTok viral moment. We have these like every couple months at TD Baby, like really big TikTok viral moments, you know, out of nowhere. And then, um, you know, often it's not the new single and that person, you know, in the CD Baby world might not be with us anymore. And it's like their old things resonating so that all the music in the ecosystem, I think it operates a little bit differently on these new platforms in that we don't get to call the shots as, as much um, on what is important. I'm sure RCA didn't love that the CD Baby thing went super viral for their artists and they don't have that song. Um, and that artist, rightly so, didn't then move that song into their RCA deal, because why would they? Um, and so it's about um, that volume is certainly, you know, on our, our end, supply chain is like, it's a laborious task to make sure that we can be compliant with our partners, because that's what we're there for. Um, but on the scale, it's about empowering this, this potential success in the future. And uh, in our model is, is, is uh, really important. We don't want that song to ever come down. We're not going to charge you next year to keep that song up. There's no reason we should remove music from the world just because you don't have another few dollars. So we keep those up and it makes those viral success moments happen. And it's great that somebody can park an old song in a distributor and give it sync rights. And then we can get it. We got like a, a random band, great uh, rock band from Milwaukee who had one record in 1978 in Stranger Things. And um, it's a great record. It only existed on, this is a random anecdote, but it only existed on CD Baby because in like 2018, two of the guys reunited and released a second record and then they digitized the old one. And that's, that's um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that they digitized the old one. It's an incredible record and like, it's a, it's a high five moment for us to get a song of Stranger Things, let alone one with that kind of unique history. And so that's why like the glut of music um, the good and bad makes it all be good in a way. I think too, it levels the playing field across um, indies and major and frontline labels because you know it does come down to how you're bringing your music to the market. And you know, I think it was you, Lloyd, who were talking about like you know you have all those like best practices and everyone can kind of recite them at nauseum. But that's why those are so critical because it is a level playing field and there is the ability and it is the most exciting time, I think, for independent music to exist and have the same shots that, you know, major label and frontline artists to have. Um, and so I say, bring it on. We, we love uh, having, giving people the choice. I think the like the, the content um, openness to every different, you know, type of, of platform or tech or um, spec of, of content delivery only, you know, from, from my perspective has only seen opportunities open and doors open even globally. So I think a lot of times, you know, um, we weren't going to talk about spatial today, but I'll say it anyway. Um, 
you know, when when you turn down, here's all the opportunities to reach a fan where they and greet them where they are ready to listen to your music. Every time you uncheck a box is another person you lose in your audience. And so, you know, things like spatial, things like um, clean versions so that they can go to countries that only accept clean versions of your music, um, you know, delivering alternative types of, of assets. Those are every single thing you, you do and you put into it uh, is another door that opens for, for your audience. And I think um, being precious with, oh, I, I don't respect that format, so I'm not going to participate in it. Find somebody to help you navigate how to do it that makes it feel right for you. You know, we're not we're not saying uh, change the integrity of your art. Definitely not. That's the thing that we need to preserve. It's it's there's a, a million different resources to help you embrace that platform or that asset or that delivery type that will help you reach another fan in a different country, a different platform, a different way. Um, that's really those. That's that's how you you break through the barriers of the content. Is just give yourself the opportunity to meet fans where they are. Definitely, we have um, at Foundy. We've got it's it's marketing tools. So we've got like a pixel concept, and a lot of people just don't cap. They have a lot of interactions with fans that just never capture. And so um, you know, just making sure to your point. That record from a couple of years ago is creating fan data for you. If you're not paying attention to utilizing that right now, you're just trying again over and over. And um, you know, use all resources and text messaging and email, li and email lists are still incredibly valuable um, and I think are quite ignored um, you know, often. Yeah. We have, um, we've got about a little bit over 10 minutes left. So um, we're gonna do a Q&A, sorry. Um, but if, uh, if, if we want to start, we have a microphone up here. Um, please raise your hand. Somebody can run the microphone to you. Any questions? Cool. I don't know who's running mics, but I guess we'll do it. Ourselves. Go for it. You're good? Okay. We'll, re we'll repeat it once yeah. you, so that. Yeah. Um, so with a small label, and you know, we are probably <laughs> Maybe guy leave right when we needed him. Yeah. Um, we're you know we're drowning in data. You know we get data from all the DSPs. We get data from social media. We have a wonderful orchard um, workstation. I uh, use chart metric. Is there any hope in the next few years we may see indies be able to get? Um, you know, a platform, I'm thinking like Soda Tone that, that Warner uses, something where we could maybe upload our data into like a chart metric type situation or, you know, an Orchard workstation or an Ingrus workstation be able to, uh, you know, upload our, our social data, any other data that we see will fit. So like really what we need is, action, you know, analysis more than we need data. Um, and with a small team, it can be hard just you know, we'd literally, someone would just be crunching data all day long if we were trying to um, come back with insights. So I just wanted to get um, you guys' take on what the future of maybe insights and, um, you know, deeper platforms um, for indie labels are. So, I mean, uh, the Orchard has uh, insights and also, you know, through a mobile app, Orchard Go, and it is in a place where it is serving data up to you. But I think to your point, we will constantly, I think that's the thing that's probably changing faster than the, landscape of consumption is probably probably how we're all harnessing technology and trying to leverage it you know to be faster and to make more educated decisions um so i think you will probably see that hopefully very soon i think we've longed over the years for a central source that pulls in dsp data physical data international data social data competitive data and it's just that you know probably for rules and legal stuff that I don't know about it. That's probably part of the reason why. Um, but we've got to solve for that if we're, if we're going to figure this whole thing out. So um, I don't have a great answer for you, but I know we're all, you know, all of our companies are, are trying to figure out ways to pull in um, 
different types of information to give that bigger picture. And then, as I was saying before, like a dashboard is just a dashboard. It's, there's there's got to be a prescriptive part of it to help guide um, if it's going to be helpful. We're doing that the best we can with our own data, with our own for our own artists and labels. Um, but we also recognize, like without the competitive and without the other things, it's it's only part of the story. And I think there's two buckets you're you're thinking about. Like it's a, a BI tool that you could add to. It sounds in Excellent, um, and I think that's where like key supply chain partners that are a little bit agnostic, but involved. Might you know we own Fuga, and I like I'm hearing that, and that's something in our in our world that's that's a Fuga project and like clear value there. But then there's the engagement engagement data. So like all of that is insights from platforms about what happened, and you can't really poke back into that platform without playing, paying the platform to reach those people versus the engagement data of who is interacting in places I can control. And that may be on social media. So, you know, me sharing a, be on Twitter, sharing a YouTube video, you know, I can pay Twitter and YouTube forever, or I can capture that first party data and now have that data pool. So I think you can control your engagement data pool probably pretty holistically. If you're diligent about like short linking with the tool and using the pixel on every site and all, and, and having that concept, um, versus the like intelligence dashboards and uh, something I've been like really harping on lately is like all these dashboards you can see things but I, I haven't found anything with any utility of like click and do like the action which generally is just advertising for the most part but like data platform has a, um, a genre and a, um, a demographic and um, maybe one other thing you've got an ad buy right there and you can be on, like in Foundy, you can be on Complex and Pitchfork and Rolling Stone in that exact cohort, basically with the click of a button. And the only question would be like, how much do you want to spend a day? Because uh, those are actually people either going out and finding those people and doing buys or the engagement layer being like, I already engage with these people. It's just remarketing to them. Um, uh, my, my two cents there is it's... Right now we're living in this world where we're like, okay, I get this piece from this platform, this piece from this platform. You guys might see this in your account. I got to call management. I got to call this. Um, and especially at Warner, I think we um, are really, really invested in knowing as much as we can. And so, but with that comes five different platforms that we have to know how to look at and then cross form. Um, you know, to, to throw it back on, on the labels and the artists, like the best way that you can take advantage of that is to have a team that can look at everything holistically. Um, when you hide like, okay, I'm going to keep my social data or my digital data away, but they can see the sales, you know, uh, my digital team is like, cool, all this stuff we're doing on TikTok, I don't know how it's translating to streams or um, all the playlisting we got. I don't know if they're actually translating into people following you on social and how does that, you know, lead into them buying merch and buying tickets and you know, clicking a pre-save, it's all, it's a holistic market. Um, it's a holistic fan. And so I think being able to um, have as much visibility into like the, the journey of a fan is the best way that you can arm yourself as a label or as an artist with, you know, making stuff happen for sure. Cool, do we have any other questions? Hello, hey. how are you going? Microphone. Um, I was just wondering, um, do all of you offer um, discovery mode from Spotify? And if so, how do you um, how do you offer it to your existing clients? Is it an opt-in thing? Um, and um, what do you see as the future of discovery mode um, now that more indies are, are being onboarded and being able to offer it to people? Um, and do you see it as a positive or detrimental thing in the long term? Does we would not want to answer that. <laughs> I'll, I'll make one comment. We um, we've had a lot of success with it. Um, I think um, that might have an arc to it, but I think it's um, it's been very successful. And you can read about it on Spotify for Artists blog. In our case, if an artist, you know, we're some case studies, but um, it um, you know it's a different way to reach where you couldn't reach, and you know it's a tactic. I think, I think it's an interesting product to enter a space where everything is algorithmic. And especially as we press our partners to think more creatively on how to give us a way to be more um, uh, tangibly intentional with how we use these products, you know, things like marquee and discovery mode, 
um, the more we can get to a space where we can be really intentional with with the usage of it. Like, I want to target people who listened to Daft Punk three years ago and haven't listened since, and that's what that's a high CPM that I'll pay for is more of the place that you know we're we're pressing our DSPs to think. Um, I I think there's like some general um, red area that we can't go into on like your you know to give you like direct questions and answers because I think every single uh, company here has a different you know kind of business structure with that. But um, my my thought with it as a strategic marketer is um, if the tool isn't um, specifically helping your strategy and showing you direct engagement and direct like ROI, you don't have to use it because it's the flavor of the month. There's a bunch of different ways to do that. And so in these conversations with my team, we, we push back and say, this is really valuable to us if we can use it this way. Sorry, we don't have, we can't give you all those answers, but great question. So I have two questions. Um, the first one is, uh, what is the fundamental difference between distributors who serve labels versus individual artists? Um, and a difference related to marketing services. And then the second part of the question is, um, how, are you, uh, how are your marketing services evolving uh, to meet the increasing request for catalog marketing and uh, catalog marketing strategies? I will say, um, I mean, at The Orchard, we do have an artist services um, sector of business, which we do sign artists directly. And you know, those teams are supported with product managers, a radio um, staff, press, publicity, things like that. Um, for our label distribution clients, um, they have access to like uplift an artist or to participate in that as needed, but those aren't services. I mean, they don't, they have a label manager, but they don't necessarily have a product manager scheduling video shoots and managing budgets and P&Ls and that type of stuff. Um, and the catalog is an increasingly uh, interesting piece of business that I think we probably are all uh, chasing and, you know, really supportive of and I think that we're all trying to kind of really build out those catalog teams and make sure that that's not a forgotten piece of business um, and I think I'm missing a piece of your question but I think on the marketing side you know I think that it's we're really trying to make sure that we're keeping our marketing pushing forward and making sure that we're you know continuing to support YouTube optimization and get into short form video and content creation and things like that. I think just trying to kind of hear and listen what's going on in the market and listening to our clients and kind of being able to respond to that uh, in quick time is critical. Um, I'll do a short answer and say, I, you know, we're set up to do label or artist deals. Label deals tend to work a little better for a lot of what we do because of the way that our technology works and provides the insights that it does. Um, I think when it comes to catalog, um, yeah, you're right. It, it, it's a, a, um, a growing part of the business. Um, and we've developed a, a checklist of different things that we go after when we're talking, especially to labels who have artists who are either not involved, not alive, not engaged, whatever else it is, um, that they can do a lot of basics and best practices. And we, we see lifts when, um, when they, when they do that and they go through that, that checklist process. Yeah, and I think the, the artists, you know, the artists or the hub is the manager, different general goals than what if the label is the partner and, and the label goals and structure and executing as a label um, removed from the artist. It just creates a different um, dichotomy of how you how you interact. Um, and uh, in our model, they're in literally different companies. Um, labels are serviced by a Fuga like company where artists are serviced serviced by, generally speaking, like downtown music services and a frontline label services model. Um, really quickly, ADA has both. We do artists and label. Um, and we, we also have a catalog division um, with a head of catalog who just focuses on holistic marketing with a catalog hat and strategy on. Um, we we kind of look at catalog as, and I said this earlier, as, as real estate. It's something that is a constant source of monetization for artists um, and can always have a moment um, and should be treated like a constantly 
living and breathing um, entity. And that's the way that, that we think about it for sure. Um, awesome, really great questions, guys. Um, we're out of time, I wish we could do more questions, yeah. but it was so nice to talk mm -hmm. with you. Thank you so much for everything. And thank you, panelists. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. you did a great job.